A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 179th episode of Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. Just over two years ago, when the pandemic had just set in and schools had closed down, we at Notebook felt it was our duty to set up a platform for educators to connect meaningfully on discussing problems they were facing with the rising need of digital education and online learning and arrive at common solutions. Today, 179 episodes later, this platform has grown much bigger than we could have ever anticipated, all thanks to your love and support. We have discussed extremely curricular topics here like digital learning, NEP and assessments, extracurricular topics like sports and theater, topics like school finance and management, and even evolved topics like mental health. Today, we are going to discuss a very interesting topic, a topic that is often asked of us, why is this being discussed in a school webinar? Reacting versus responding. Today, in our, all our schools, in our education system, we are grooming citizens for tomorrow. How the world would be, how the country would behave in the coming years would depend on how these young men and women are brought up. We often see that a knee-jerk reaction from individuals or society or media or the powers that be often cause a ripple effect that change the way society behaves, the way society works. We have often come across jokes of how reaction and response are two very different things. Today, we want to look at this particular aspect and discuss how our education system teaches our young ones, our future citizens, the differences between reacting and responding. The first speaker on this topic is Mr. Philip Burrett. Mr. Burrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Dune School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions. Mr. Burrett served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of student welfare, deputy headmaster, second master and acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College UK in the year 2000 and is also an athlete, an adventurer and a naturalist. And we at Notebook are privileged to have Mr. Barrett as a senior advisor. Sir, thank you so much for being here today. We look forward to hearing from your wealth of experience on the differences between reacting and responding. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Bayu, for that introduction. I hope I am audible. Perfectly, uh, sir. And uh, a very good evening to Achan Abhishek, Meghna Gagori, and everyone over there at Notebook, as well as to our very esteemed panelists, who I'm looking forward to hearing from, and the guests who have tuned in. Um, uh, a beautiful topic. Um, I've done some reading on this. Um, both words initially seem to carry a similar meaning, same meaning. In common parlance, we would use these words quite interchangeably. But in reality, they convey two very different meanings. Um, you know, we human beings, uh, we, we, we interact with each other, uh, whether it's in our families or whether it's in our workplace or whether it's in our schools. And uh, it is through these interactions that we, we, we develop closer bonds. Uh, you know, the tribes got together to form nations and we are communities, we live in countries. And I think it's very important that the way we communicate is what uh, develops and builds on friendships, which are very crucial. And all human relationships depend on a stimulus and a response. So if you look at or hear two people talking, it's always somebody with a joke or a conversation or a question, and there's also a response. Now, therefore, it's very important uh, to keep, uh, it's, it's crucial to learn to communicate with respect, uh, to, to interact with, uh, with, with respect and, uh, you know, care for the other. And this is where this division between responding and uh, reacting comes in. There are only two ways you can go. You can either respond or you can react. Um, actually speaking, if you look at the brain, um, you know, 250,000 years ago, from the plains of uh, the in, in, in East Africa, uh, we never had a And it is important that we did this because we only react. Uh, it, is, it is the emotional part of our brain which sets in reaction. 
And it is this reaction that saved our forefathers from the crocodiles and the lions and the black mambas on the savannah. But, um, and, and, and thanks to this um, reaction that, the, that comes from our Magdala, and the Amagdala, uh, we are living today and the species, you know, we passed our genes, uh, you know, down, down the line to our current, uh, you know, progeny. Now, these same interactive primitive reactions arise when confronted by modern day situations in which physical survival isn't threatened, but rather our psychological survival, um, our self-identity, our self-esteem. Uh, these are the present day survival instincts. There are also things like perfectionism, fear of failure, need to control, need to please. These are also what modern man faces. Now, due to the complexities of life today, reacting based on primitive instincts rarely leads to positive outcomes. For example, if a person in the office is given a foreign trip which you were looking forward to, that could create disappointment, hurt, and potential anger. You might feel overwhelmed, and you might just storm into the boss's office, threatening him or her with some, you know, with, with physical or psychological you know, repercussions. But do you really need to react in this modern world? Thankfully, we have a frontal cortex, which I'm told gets fully developed by the age of 23, 24. And because of this executive functioning, uh, which works on, which, which handles memory analysis, problem solving, weighing down the risks, considering in short-term and long-term consequences, basically decision-making, because of our frontal cortex, we are now able to respond and not to react. Now, even though the amygdala, our emotional part of the brain, may have outlived most of its, useless, uh, its usefulness, it still exerts an influence on our thinking and emotions and behavior when we are unaware of the situation. Thanks, of course, to the prefrontal cortex, we do have the capacity to override the amygdala and our emotional reactions many, many times. Now, so when faced with a difficult emergency situation, uh, we can either take a knee-jerk reaction, as the, as the uh, picture on the, the, on the notebook ad says, you know, the, the doctor hitting the knee, the knee-jerk uh, response, or we could switch off the emotional brain and take a more rational, more reasoned response. Um, as teachers, we have our buttons pressed all the time by students who are difficult, challenging. And it's up to us to react from our limbic system, which is an ancient brain, or do we, do we respond from our more uh, rational frontal cortex? Now, reacting is a knee-jerk action, as I said, and often gets one into trouble. Because once you re react, there's no going back. The punch is thrown, the hurtful words are said, the sar sarcastic remarks have been passed. And then what happens is we have a deep sense of regret, but the damage is done, the hurt is done, the scars are there. And now you can't sleep because you regret, uh, just because someone pressed a trigger. Um, now, responding, on the other hand, takes experience, maturity, and one needs to train oneself to use it. It is a figurative stepping back from the situation so that you can gather a better perspective from another angle. And then I'm getting my fists, I put the window down. But the rational part does kick in a bit later when I, when I reason for and I think empathetically to the driver who cut me off. Maybe he's rushed on the way to the hospital. Maybe he's going to pick up his daughter who's not well. It is the reason thinking that makes me respond and give him way rather than a knee-jerk anger. Now, responding is a spin-off from the word responsibility. It is considerate and deliberate reacting. On the other hand, uh, you know, we, we cannot meet uh, um, a re we cannot react rationally and immediately because that would be reacting. Now, I would say that um, 
you know, uh, take, a, take a student. A student might say something, we lash out, something serious happens. And then, then again, as I said, we, are, we, are, uh, we, are, we, we sit and regret. It's too late. Now, what we need to do is um, we need to, to have good, healthy communication. Uh, we need to know the situation that presses our buttons. We need to be aware of when we, when we react and be aware of these situations. I have seen teachers hand in the, handing in their resignations, attacking kids, saying the wrong things to parents at PTM, all because somebody pressed the wrong button. They have reacted when they should have responded. Uh, these responses of reacting are immature, will not serve any purpose, and will again lead to a lot of heartache. Responding is when you self-regulate your thoughts and emotions. And reacting is when, as I said, it's just a knee-jerk uh, 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 you know, uh, way of, way of uh, reacting. Uh, I would advise that the best way uh, to handle a situation when you don't know, uh, you know whether to react or respond would be to take a deep breath. They say that box breathing, you know, the four second inhale, hold, four second exhale, hold, would be the best way, you know, which, which moves into mindfulness. Um, uh, these are very simple, but you need to train yourself to breathe in a situation where you're feeling like reacting, but you rather respond. And the second, as I said, is we, through our experience, we should know which situations or people or events or music, whatever it is, Whatever it is that stimulates or uh, is the impetus for reaction from us. And we need to keep away from or you know, uh, guide away from these situations and people who tend to cause reaction in us. And they say that it's a 30 second gap between stimulus and response that makes all the difference between a reaction and a response. So just take a deep breath, count 30 seconds, and you're more likely to respond rather than react. Responding is harder than reacting. It takes more time. It takes more effort. Um, you have to resist that strong itch, that yearning to react immediately. And I'll tell you a lot of today's emails that we receive actually trains us to react rather than respond. In the old days, we got a letter. We opened the letter. We read the letter. Uh, we pondered over it. It lay on our desk for a couple of days. And then we wrote another letter. We put it in an envelope. We walked to the post office and posted it. This was more likely to be a response. Today, we get a nasty email. What do we do? We press, uh, we quickly put a you know, reply, write out a, a rude little note in capital letters, that too, and send immediately, press send. And then sit and regret and say, oh, now what can I do? I can't, I can't get this back. You know, it's our modern way of communication has also sort of uh, aggravated the problem. Um, um, when we react to a situation, we fuse with it. We become the situation. Going from one reaction to the next is an emotional roller coaster. When you respond to a situation, however, you put a few degrees of freedom between a deeper and more sensible a way of running your life. Um, I also think that as teachers, it is our duty to be role models and, and, to, and to role model response rather than react. And we have, in, we have numerous uh, opportunities in the class, in the playing field, in the corridors, in the dining hall, where we can actually teach our children that, uh, it, teach our children how to respond, how to have that tightness, that gap, how to wait, how to take a deep breath, how to step back, wait. Um, there's so many examples from my own life as a teacher where if I had responded immediately, uh, reacted immediately, it would have been disastrous. I waited even, you have to wait a day sometimes, sleep over it and call the student the next day and say, listen, I thought over it and this is what I said or this is what should do. And they actually appreciate it. And um, so I hope uh, this has been, um, uh, I ha have uh, opened 
um, <laughs> the, the, the avenue for further discussion through our experts and Achan. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, over to you, Shabai. Thank you, sir. Thank you so, so much for this wonderful introduction to the topic. In fact, sir, what you said went right to the heart of the reason we chose this topic in the first place. As a democracy, we are being bombarded by messaging from consumer goods to political parties to cell phones, expecting us to react. And that reaction would benefit somebody or the other. And as a society, if we become more responsive than reactive, we just have a better, more educated democracy. And so we believe that the school system lies at the heart of it. And so the examples that you gave, the various uh, aspects of response versus react that you spoke about, sir, gives us a wonderful starting platform to you know, get this discussion out from. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, on this topic is Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Ochin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. Ochin is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, a fellow of the ICAI, a member of CPA Australia and CPA Ireland, and a member of CIMA UK. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. An avid reader and a passionate traveler, Ochin has keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Ochin, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Shubhani, I'm audible? Yeah, Ochin, loud and clear. I want to welcome all of you to today's session. A very interesting topic. Now, reacting versus responding, while these words may be similar in, in terms of uh, semantics, the difference in stressful situations can be profound. The difference between the two lies in a deep breath, a pause, or a moment of mindful presence. That moment can mean the difference between sending the entire situation or relationship soaring to greater heights or falling down a slippery slope. The reactions, as we would all agree, are, are driven by instincts and stem from the subconscious mind. There's no filtering process when you when we react in a situation. It's like on autopilot. So when you react, we do and say things without thinking first. And also, obviously, don't consider the implications of what we do or say. We just act. Responses undoubtedly are more thoughtful. Like we first explore in our mind the possible outcomes of our of our reply before saying something. And there's a natural process of weighing in pros and cons. And of, of course, we try to choose what is best in the given situation. So the question today, and I think this is a wonderful topic with so many senior educators here. And as Shubai also mentioned, that as a society, I think, would we really groom leaders? We want to groom leaders who would, be, who would create a calm and happy environment around you. And not the kind of leader who is like a wild card, totally unpredictable and, con and can cause people around to stress by reacting. So being mindfully present when responding means we notice when something triggers us. I think that is very important. And we continue to observe ourselves in terms of emotional response in a given situation. So the moment we observe ourselves, we're able to distance ourselves from the experience and watch our mind react. So today if I ask that, have we ever acted out of anger, said something we didn't mean, or did something we later regretted? And I think the answer most certainly for, for any of us is yes. There have been situations in life. It does happen in real world. 
And once we answer yes to the previous question, next question obviously that will follow is that have we ever experienced anger that faded with time? Where after we stepped back and no longer felt the charge. And the reason why most of us again would answer yes to the second question is because emotions aren't static. They come and go. And our responses to situations can be greatly different from one moment to the very next. I think Bayer gave a wonderful example in terms of instantly reacting to a mail and taking time out like golden days, ensuring we write a letter and, and take the effort to go and post it. So often we, we, we hear something that we don't like or is unexpected in some way. So the natural tendency is to get defensive or judge the situation quickly. And this natural tendency of the human mind, nothing individual, to, to start running on autopilot. So there was a study, and this is really interesting as going through this, there was a study in New York University. And the findings are astonishing. The study found that a person decides how trustworthy another human being is or judges someone else in as little as 30 milliseconds. Yes, you heard me right. 30 milliseconds. Now imagine this is not enough time to, con to, to, to consciously register the face. We're discussing about 30 milliseconds. But it's enough time for the brain to make a judgment. So we all agree that at times, it's really important. It's really important to create a short pause before responding to the trigger, which can actually help us disconnect from those auto reactions and change the course of the situation completely. So a few things which I think are very important, first and foremost, pause. As soon as we notice that we are triggered, it's important to take a deep breath for instance, if you are driving and uh, for, for any reason, we are stuck in the highway. So before, or we understand someone is blocking the way, before getting into a typical uh, road rage kind of situation, which can go out of, out of hand, it's important that to take a deep breath and pause and think. The other thing which is important is labeling our reaction. So what is our feeling? Is it frustration, insecurity? Or something else. Is the example in, in this particular example, for instance, when we are stuck because of someone else, the highway, are we angry or are we anxious? Third, I think first and foremost is pause, second is labeling our reaction, and third is asking ourselves why? What actually triggered us? What is the is it the event itself? Or is it related to a previous judgment? Or there was something else which is bothering us. Maybe we are not in a good mood. Something happened in the morning. And we are, we are maybe we are, we are overreacting because already we were anxious, we are stressed. Now, this step, the moment we are ask ourselves why, this step invites us to bring more awareness in terms of our triggers and blind spots. Often the emotion is trying to tie it to something below the surface of the actual event. Actually, went to something which is visible. But there might be something else which had a profound impact. Next is, of course, choosing a skillful response. Very critical step. Where all the magic happens in the process. So as to think that, what is it that really matters? What is my goal? And how can I respond in a more product, proactive way? In a more productive way. Proactive as well as productive. A way that will move me closer to my goal. And next, of course, is empowering ourselves. Empower ourselves to move forward from that place of awareness so that we can invite a more healthier, more you know, desirable outcome for, for everyone involved. But again, uh, when we are building this self-reflective capacity, quite naturally, we are discussing about emotional intelligence, which, is, which in today's world is perhaps the most crucial factor for success in any walk of life irrespective of your domain skill, irrespective of your chosen profession. 
And so when it comes to emotional intelligence, it can said to be covered like five main areas, self-awareness, emotional control, self-motivation, empathy, and of course, relationship skills, which are important for good communication skills because it's like a gateway to, to, to better learning, friendship, academic success, employment. Now, skills such as this developed in our formative years at school often provide the foundation for future habits. And that is the reason I think it's so important. The role of educators is so important in terms of developing emotional intelligence. Now, in the mid-90s, this particular term was popularized by journalist Daniel Goldman's book, Emotional Intelligence and Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. So the bestseller. Now, the books claim that emotional intelligence is more important than IQ is a source of debate among psychologists. But it does look as if emotional intelligence could be a factor in academic achievement. Now, there's a, there's a study, a very iconic study, which tracked high IQ students from childhood to late adulthood. So they took a sample and they surveyed their, their entire journey, starting from uh, childhood to late adulthood, and found that those who achieved notable adult career success showed, and these are some traits which were common, showed greater willpower, perseverance, and desire to excel. And again, all this you would agree is with regard to self-control, is with regard to emotional intelligence. Meanwhile, evidence from the, from the seminal marshmallow test, which many of you would be aware, which, which was like, which gave the children the, the option to have more treats if they could wait before eating them, suggested that delayed gratification and self-control are important. Again, controlling your mind, marshmallow test. With these characteristics being linked to better school grades, earnings, and job satisfaction. So in all situations, it has been seen that how important and how crucial, crucial and critical emotional intelligence is. So regardless of debates over whether emotional intelligence can be measured, I believe it's worthwhile to uh, look at some main facets which actually constitute this entire, uh, uh, you know, actually constitutes emotional intelligence. First and foremost, active listening, skill of active listening which is like a key part of helping create genuine two-way communication. And it's about far more than just paying attention. That's only one part of active listening. The moment we hear active listening, first thing that comes to our mind is paying attention. Yes, of course, it's important, but only one part. It involves genuinely following dialogue and responding to others using your body language. Then being able to demonstrate that you have understood by verbally summarizing back if required key messages that have been received. Now, in recently, in, in the classroom, a recent review found that, and this was a global review, that 38% of feedback interventions, and this was not in, uh, in terms of school, this was in terms of students in higher education, a recent review found that 38% of feedback interventions were not working. And why so? Because Students often made common mistakes when receiving this feedback. The problem was not on part of educators, but on part of those who were receiving this feedback. Higher education students in universities, colleges, research institutes, and why so? Because they are mis misinterpreting it as being a personal judgment on who they are. For example, thinking about when the speaker will uh, uh, put, uh, finish talking so that they can reply instead of listening fully. To what is being said. So they are resisting. The skill of active listening is, is a key part of helping create genuine two-way communication. And it's far more than just paying attention. So that, that's, I think, one very, very important trait. The other is developing self-awareness. Now, when we have low self-awareness, we are at risk of not realizing now that we come across as to how we come across to others. And letting an over-inflated self-image skew our behavior and social interactions. Now again, a, a, a very well-known study once saw researchers ask students how they thought they did in a test. The students were actually asked, then how do you think you performed before the results were out? And then compared their perceptions with their actual results. They found that most students overestimated their ability. With this most likely to be 
in case of students who had done poorly, who were not put into great in exams. So uh, researchers have named this as Dunning-Kruger effect. And it's one of the most common thinking biases in education globally. They found that the strategy is to help students improve their self-awareness, include teaching them metacognitive strategies. One way of doing them is to encourage them to ask self-reflective questions, such as, what could I have done differently? Or use a, use a more like self-evaluation questionnaire, which can help students begin to understand their interpersonal skills. Next, of course, is uh, showing empathy as being with others, which can, which can never go wrong. The ability to take the perspective of another person while being non-judgmental, recognizing the emotions, their feelings, and being able to convey their perspective back to them. Now, evidence suggests that reading is a great way to develop this skill. Short animated videos, also a great conversation starter to use with students in this particular regard. Reflecting back the other person's perspective, you know, it actually helps to make the other person feel understood, which in turn increases the likelihood of collaboration and support. Now, children generally develop empathy through observing how others show it, their role models, including, of course, watching parents, teachers, their peers, empathize with each other. So using phrases such as, I understand, I realize, I can see, can actually help to show students how understanding of other, pers other person's perspective can be expressed. Next, of course, is managing emotions and self-regulation. So helping them to actually improve their self-regulation, ability to manage their thoughts and feelings, especially, so, and, and especially during teenage years, when there's a gap between impulse control and sensation, sensation seeking, early teenage years. Now, when we discuss about self-regulation technique, what do they look like? These are approaches that are used by, very common example is used by athletes, which can be applied to classroom. Principles remain the same. This include looking at seeing events, looking at events as an opportunity rather than a threat, as helpful self-talk, for example, and reinforce to students that emotional management skills are not fixed, but can be developed. So I think uh, it's a wonderful topic. And these are a few thoughts that I wanted to share with all of you. I sincerely thank all of you for giving me a very patient hearing. We have a panel of very esteemed uh, senior educators here with decades of experience. And I sincerely look forward to hear from them, their perspective and experience on this wonderful topic. I thank all of you again. Over to you, Shuvan. Thank you, Ashin. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Ashin mentioned, we do have a wonderful panel lined up for you. But before we start with the panel discussion, a little bit about us here at Roadbook. We at Roadbook are an edtech platform that creates short videos pertaining to the school curriculum. This means that every topic from every subject of the school syllabus has been converted into a number of short videos that can be used in two different cases. One is when you as a teacher are starting out a topic in your classroom, you can play one of these videos as a method of visually introducing the topic to your students. These videos take up just six to 10 minutes of your classroom time and offer the kids the right kind of visual material to generate their curiosity and excitement. The second is when the student is studying at home, maybe months later, they will have access to the same videos on their personal devices. Maybe it's their laptop or their smartphone. They can watch the videos over and over again until they get a very clear understanding of the topic that you had taught. What I'm gonna do now is play some short snippets of notebook videos so that you know exactly what they look like. Can we have the video, please? Hello, students. Welcome to today's video lesson. Before we begin today's discussion, let me ask, how many of you here are artists? How many of you are painters or appreciate paintings and sketches? Chapter begins with a small anecdote about an 8th century Chinese painter, Wu Daozi. His last painting was a landscape which was authorized and sponsored by the Tang Emperor Xuanzong to decorate a palace wall. After his work was completed, he called on the emperor to view and appreciate his painting. He had hidden his painting behind a screen so that only the emperor could view it. The first step is ingestion. This is the intake of food in complex form. Digestion follows ingestion 
and involves the breakdown of the complex food into simpler substances. After digestion, absorption occurs, which is the passage of simpler food into the blood or lymph. The next step is very crucial and is called assimilation, where the absorbed food is utilized for providing energy for various activities. The last and final step is ejection, where undigested food is removed from the body. What if you are asked where do you live and you end up saying that I'm coming from Kolkata? What do you think may put off your interviewer? The answer? No. The fact that the sentence is grammatically incorrect may be a turning point in the conversation. In ancient times, human beings first voiced peculiar sounds to convey their thoughts. Later, they symbolically represented those sounds. Finally, people analyzed the language further to observe its patterns and forms. This analysis paved the way to the modernization of the English language. Hello students. Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, those were some short snippets from notebook videos. Today, we have connected with over 2,000 schools and have had 26 lakh students benefit from such videos. If you head over to our website, www.notebook.school, or use our mobile apps for Android and iOS, you would find more than 10,000 such videos at your disposal. With that, it is now time to introduce the panelists that we have with us today. We have with us Dr. Madhulika Singh. Dr. Singh is the principal of Gandhi International Public School, Meerut. She is an MSc in Botany, an MED, and has also qualified the NET. She has completed her doctorate from CCS University. She has nearly 15 years of experience with seven years of experience in higher education and the rest in school with over six years at the administrative levels. She has gained immense experience in establishing and running the school effectively and efficiently. Dr. Singh has published more than 10 research works in various national and international journals on various aspects of child psychology and teaching methodology. Ma'am, thank you so much for being here on the panel. Thank you so much for joining us today. We also have with us Mrs. Poonam Navid. She's widely experienced, innovative, and creative leading. And inspiring and guiding a team of more than 300 staff members and 8,000 students across four schools. She's a bright alumnus of the Kendriya Vidyale Chakeri Kanpur and did her master's in English and history from Kurukshetra University. She joined Prata Public School in 1992 and was soon elevated to the in charge of the primary wing of the school. In the year 2007, Mrs. Navet was appointed principal of Prata Public School, Jarnali Kalli, Karnal. She has been holding the additional charge of director of Prata Group of Schools since 2011. She is also serving as the vice president of Sahodia Schools Complex, Karnal, and is the district training coordinator for Karnal. Under her stewardship, the school has scaled newer heights of excellence in both academics and sports. She has an evolved consciousness of her emulative role as a leader whose vision, ideas, and their execution shape the future of this great nation and is credited with pioneering digitization of classrooms in city Karnal. Mrs. Navit is a votary of general equal, gender equality and a crusader against social evils and environmental degradations. She has initiated innumerable rallies and silent marches in the city to educate people about these. Ma'am, thank you so much for being here on the panel. We look forward to hearing your views today. We also have with us Ms. Tanuja Sharma. Ms. Sharma is an experienced counseling psychologist with a demonstrated history of working in the education management industry. She is skilled in training, delivery, behavior, and project management, interviewing, organization development, and recruiting. She is also a personal and professional development and well being coach, a motivational speaker, a program mentor, advisor, and panelist on board with various organizations. She has been awarded with numerous prestigious awards some of which are the Certificate of Excellence by the Board of Directors, the Governing Body for Indian Schools in Oman. She has also been honored as the Honorary Advisor, School Counseling Project of Child Against, Children Against Child Abuse by Social Axiom Insignia, SAI, and has been nominated as the external member on the panel for Internal Complaint Committee at Indian Spinal Injury Center for Sexual Harassment Prevention. She's a certified career planner, a certified and trained telecounselor, and also a content writer. Ma'am, thank you so, so much for sparing the time to be here today. We look forward to hearing your thoughts and opinions on this topic. At this point, I shall invite the panelists to please switch on your cameras. 
I will have to beg your pardon. I'm currently sitting in a place with a power outage, so I'll not be able to switch on my camera, but I'm sure it's your opinions that the audience are eagerly looking forward to. Once again, a very good evening. Dr. Singh, if I may come to you first. My first question to you is, how do you teach young students to respond and not to react? Over to you, ma'am. Dr. Singh, you'll have to unmute yourself. Please. Yes, 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 yes. Thank uh, you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. First of all, such a um, huge, uh, giving me the uh, opportunity to be on a such a panel list where such a light and uh, learned members are there. And uh, uh, really, the uh, uh, topic is quite interesting, react reaction between responding. Loud. Like now, recent times, we are seeing these... Uh, there are such, uh, we have seen our students re uh, reacting most of the time and they are uh, agree, becoming aggressive, frustrated, just because, and especially uh, after pandemic, we have seen these changes in our students. So I think in a school, there are many situations where we can teach them how to react. Uh, like today itself, we had a small incident in our school where a, a student was talking since a parent came with a complaint and the student was uh, talking to a, a teen uh, like a teenager student of class eight he was talking to his teacher as if he, that teacher is not a teacher or some uh, he's like, like some of some of his friends so basically we have seen that these things are uh, uh, in uh, being found in our uh, students so there these uh, it could be taken care of in the classes like when the, whenever the two, teacher is there in the class we request the teachers or we have guided them to just first identify what uh, emotional levels they are on like some students can be good disciplined and they can regulate their emotions but some cannot be because they come from a family background where they are uh, taught or they see their parents uh, being in, uh, too re uh, uh, spontaneous in reactions, like a mother is not keen on uh, get uh, hearing about what the child is going through in the school, or if uh, a child complains, the father says, uh, ask, pacifies him by saying, "Don't worry, I am take, uh, there to take care of your uh, all whatever has happened bad in you, with you in school." So basically, these are the things uh, which have to be identified in the classes. The teacher has to make sure that a student is pacified there and he is allowed to uh, uh, voice their emotions during the, uh, the class uh, uh, rooms. Like uh, they can be asked to uh, share what they like, what they dislike, or what has hurted them, what they feel is sad, uh, what they feel sad about, and what they feel happy about. So these things could be done in the classes. Uh, and other than this, they can be then uh, counseled how they could really go through a particular situation, and especially an uneventful situation, according to the students. So uh, I think this way we can, during in the schools, uh, guide the stu students to basically uh, know uh, how they can learn to respond. As uh, Ms. Uh, Philip has real uh, shared, ki we should uh, ask them to just respond and uh, know uh, how to regulate their emotions. Uh, uh, many are times we have seen ki the students are not even, uh, uh, what I should say, ki like they're not ready to uh, uh, wait or they want to just uh, uh, pacify or, on the same instinct or they want to just uh, solve those their problems at, at the same uh, instance. So uh, these things should be uh, regularized by counseling the students on a time to time in the schools, giving uh, uh, them regular, like sh uh, showing them certain um, uh, videos for uh, regularizing their video uh, emotions. And obviously the teacher in the school could act as their counselor. So I think these are the ways where a school can play their role to uh, how to uh, regularize the uh, how the students could be trained to learn to respond rather than to react. 
thank you so much ma'am i think uh, some very valid points there particularly open lines of communication and having the counselor involved should definitely help uh, yes, mrs sir. navit mrs navit ma'am if i may come to you next ma'am what are some of the strategies that you are employing in your schools to uh, teach your students the difference between reacting and responding ma'am you have to unmute yourself please thank you so much thank you subhayu and thank you team notebook for inviting me to this panel discussion at the very outset i would like to congratulate you for bringing such an important topic for discussion reacting versus responding for many of us reacting is same as responding and if at all there is any difference it could just be in semantics and uh, thesaurus also says that reacting and uh, responding are uh, synonymous whereas you know if you look around there is a world of difference between the two i have been in teaching profession for good 3 decades but honestly speaking i have never pondered or dwelt on the subject let alone making an endeavor to teach students the difference between response and reaction you know at school we teach various subjects like language math science physics chemistry biology but seldom do we teach them when to react when to respond and how to respond i'm sure that the knowledge that they get from the subjects they learn in school may or may not guarantee a happy life but if students are made to learn the difference between reaction and response and ways to respond rather than react from an early age i'm sure they can live their life happily they can get rid of myriad problems like stress tension that have become so integral to our modern living we have no idea how many friendships like this the philip was saying and relationship can be saved from being lost or broken if instead of reacting mindlessly we learn to respond thoughtfully we can make better decisions a lot of decisions could have been made different if people have responded in a given situation instead of reacting say if a student got poor score in maths and this happens very often with us uh um, he got a score which is much below his expectations he gets so disappointed that he immediately immediately decides to quit maths and instead take up an easy subject uh, a simple subject like music physical education or painting which means a different field a different career which later on he may or he may not uh, like it however if the student had paused to reflect on why his score was low was it because he really did not understand the subject or did he know it all but just ended up committing some silly mistake he would have landed up in his dream profession not only this today you know many of the student not just quit the subject they quit from life itself a string of societies happened in tamil nadu last week is an eye opener for all educators when student find it difficult to navigate through the pressure of living up to the expectations of the parents and teachers they have started putting an end to their life therefore school should be mandated to design the curriculum in such a way that students get opportunities to learn to respond to all kinds of situation pleasant or provoking easy or challenging now coming to your question uh, how to teach students to respond and not to react uh, you know to teach students how to respond and not to react is not an easy thing it's going to be an enormous task since i have told you in the beginning that for the past 30 years i have been in this profession and i have never made an endeavor in this direction so you know when i got this topic i started thinking about it and i realized there is no technique through which we can learn the art of responding overnight it is a skill which comes the hard way uh, it could be through regular and continuous practice so first and foremost thing that we can do in school is to make students understand that there is a difference between reaction and response reaction is sudden it is immediate almost involuntary impulsive and unconscious it is based on some fear or insecurities when one feels threatened his mind acts or behaves in a way that at time is completely not in sync with his real persona and he might carry the guilt later also we see the reaction is pattern it is autopilot whenever our ego is hurt 
or whenever our you know like position is threatened the reaction that is running in the pathway of our unconscious mind take hold of us and we get sad we get angry we get upset and at times we lash out at people around us on the contrary response is more reflective well thought mature and sober it allows time between the stimulus and the reaction if we pause in a, in the same situation if we pause observe the situation understand the cause we'll find ourselves dealing with the situation all of us for that matter dealing with the situation in a better way the outcome of a reaction may or may not be negative but the outcome of a response is invariably positive and this we have to teach children any ordinary situation can be made chaotic any friend can turn into a foe if our actions are reckless and unconscious and the same in the same situation uh, you can find uh, in the same situation can be rewarding it could be enriching and worth cherishing if we have choose our response carefully so it's necessary that students know the difference between reaction and response and also the consequences so this is the first thing secondly what we can do is like uh, sir was also saying that we can make students practice meditation on regular basis breathing exercise inhaling and exhaling meditation teaches us self control and how to manage and regulate our emotions a person who can exercise self control can manage any emotional outburst and believe you me such people seldom react and uh, if you look around you'll find that people who react easily are emotionally weak and the people who are confident they are emotionally strong they seldom react they evaluate the situation they analyze the situation before jumping into conclusion an emotionally balanced person draws strength from within and does not count you know we don't need anybody's certificate they don't count for external validation and thus is rarely provoked next thing that we can do in the class in the school is that in the classroom teaching learning activities can be planned in such a way that provide opportunities to students to practice how to respond to various stimuli that uh, they come across in their day to day life for so this teacher can assign group activities like uh, uh, discussions debate and projects where students get opportunities to interact with each other formally in a formal and as well as an informal environment but uh, better in a formal environment they learn how to respond to greetings they greet each other and they learn how to respond to greetings and in the process they attempt to be friendly they respect each other's viewpoint they learn to be good listeners and to be good listeners the way um, mr bhattacharya said that listener doesn't mean paying attention to be empathetic so they speak in a tone which is friendly they learn to manage disagreements and disappointments without losing their cool and with regular practice they learn to choose response remember response can be chosen but reactions are cannot reactions are involuntary next teachers can share stories they take up they can take up a case study from the, our daily life and then uh, they can read out the case study and then ask responses from the student the very interesting story that is around is cockroach story uh the teacher can you know a similar kind of stories can be read in the class and then they can ask students a question also like if you are uh, telling them cockroach story after the story you can ask uh, tell students please tell who has reacted and who has responded do you think the behavior of the lady was right what would have been your reaction if you were in uh, her place students would give diverse answers some would say yelling and shouting was unnecessary some would say oh the lady was frightened so it came very naturally to her it was it's okay some would answer the waiter was intelligent now look the waiter is a waiter and the lady is far more educated than the waiter but she failed to handle the situation wisely whereas the waiter managed to deal with the situation actively or uh, wonderfully so when you bring examples like this when you uh, bring stories like this could cook up stories to teach them very how to respond to various stimuli they learn the importance of response and maybe when they encounter such a situation they know how to handle it last and the most important way is that teachers be a role model for them the way teacher responds to various pleasant and unpleasant situation she indirectly imparts lesson to students so as to how one should receive 
analyze the situation and chooses responses. In fact, teachers need to model several important life skills in the class, like, uh, you know, apologizing, owning up to mistakes and identifying feelings. The way teacher behaves in the class, it percolates down to the students. And uh, there is a saying that uh, children have never been good at listening to the elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. So, you know, these are the five things I thought can be done in order to teach students how to respond and not react. Thank you. Mom, thank you so, so much. Those five things that you listed out are so, so valid. First of all, thank you so much for acknowledging that there is this gap in our education system where we perhaps should design our curriculum to include more of life skills like responding versus reacting. Also, ma'am, uh, to your last point, I believe while it has not found a place in curriculum as such, but the way teachers model so many of life skills, I mean, we belong to an entire generation where most of us picked up our life skills even unknowingly, watching our students model them. I mean, I have been in fights in school where the teacher would come and break us up and say, listen, I agree to both of you. Tomorrow, I'm going to sleep over it tonight and tomorrow morning I'll tell you which one I, of you I agree with more. And that perhaps taught us that same lesson back then. So hats off to you, all your teachers, for being such wonderful role models to generation after generation of our students. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Sharma, if I may come to you next. Ma'am, what are some of the moves that you would plan for your school where uh, if you were to kind of teach your students in a correct classroom setting or any part of school, the difference between reacting versus responding? Hello, am I on? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good hear evening uh, to all the panelists and the audience. And thank you so very much, Mr. Subhayu, for the very question. Uh, when the discussion was on, uh, and uh, Ms. Poonam, uh, Dr. Madhulika, ma'am, they all were uh, sharing their experience and observations. Uh, I was keenly listening. And to begin with, uh, I would like to begin with what uh, Mr. Uh, Achin have mentioned, that emotions are, emotions can come and go. This is the one point I would like everybody's attention to, that emotions can come and go. And second, reaction, reaction or reacting or uh, responding comes out of observations, as uh, Poonam ma'am have rightly mentioned this part, and that was at the core of what I was about to you know, mention. The children are good observers. They observe even what you don't teach them directly. And they imbibe and represent the same. They're the two key points I want to mention over here because my further elaboration or discussion would be based on these two points. When we say emotions can come and go, uh, taking the first point first, we have to ponder upon that when emotions can come and go, emotions can be positive, emotions can be negative, right? I mean, constructive or negative or just, uh, what to say, destructive emotions, if we, if we could just broadly categorize it for the sake of understanding. Reaction as in general is definitely considered not so constructive a sort of response or emotion because it, it is uh, what to say a product of emotions as it is rightly said after saying something in, in, a, in a flush of moment uh, a person may regret it later for example if i could give you that example for the moment but the question is is the reaction or emotionally driven reaction if i could say or an even response is that bad for all the time? Is, is, is a poking question I'm asking for each one on the panel as well as the audience. Because uh, what is happening, generally we are taking that a reaction is negative, definitely, yes. When we do something without understanding its consequences, without understanding its repercussions, or even without uh, having a sort of empathy, definitely it has its devastating consequences. I, I would like to mention an example over here. Recently, um, I think the last week or this week, we heard there is a girl who was on scooty. I hope everybody would have heard of that. I'm sorry, I'm not able to recall the place it, it have happened. Uh, she was on scooty and a person in front of her 
on cycle was not giving the way. The girl brutally slit the boy's neck or throat and the boy died on the spot. Now uh, I would like to use this unfortunate incident for everybody's attention and to see what was all this in the situation reaction response there were bystanders there were people around what was were they responding or were they reacting or they failed to do any any of these reactions as i said could be positive when when uh, somebody wins for example and it comes like oh yes i got the point you know spontaneously they don't plan it they don't think about it but it comes naturally so reactions could be even positive or could be negative but here we are focusing definitely from a, a very intense point of view of how to make the students or the education system more constructive in terms of reaction and responding being responsible as, as the word was used being responsible for your responses coming to the second point as i did mention the children do observe children do follow they imbibe and after a repetition it they become conditioned in producing the same sort of response or so-called reaction now school is an environment where children are learning most of their family definitely the first uh, school and the school environment they're learning their traits learning new skills and their personality is shaping up if if i could uh, bring in uh, with the permission of all uh, on the panel if if we could look at the school environment nowadays there are a uh, school environment or the report of the you know as uh, puna ma'am have rightly brought the incidents of uh, self harm or suicide recently again the fights road rage right and how even people who are coming out of the school in the society when they are coming in how they are responding how they are reacting to the situation is is all the by product if we could look at that right so schools are the building block definitely but if it is building block what sort of attention are we paying we do have trainings for we, we do have rather fire drills right we do have fire drills for example is there any drill or a situation or sort of training in any of the schools across on how to respond right new education policy is coming but where are these sort of practical skill building uh, you know uh, the syllabi i would say which is more of a, a practical approach in nature so yes at the same time uh, the another aspect in the second point only teachers which are at the core of the whole system definitely the first contact for the students first contact for the parents and the school administration you know both ways up up way and down ways now a person or an individual or a professional i should say if they themselves are not being taken care of or trained trained in that skill how far do we think they will be really able to imbibe in a standardized way teachers do have their own persona everybody have their own individual skills definitely how how they individually pass on the uh, values the ethics empathy and these sort of uh, uh, things to the children that's a different game altogether but what i'm talking about is i'm talking about standard approach the system since i have been into education system for about 22 years now right uh, i have got an opportunity to observe it up front and close through colleagues to training programs and i mean to various schools and teachers the conditions are such that they themselves feel pressed they don't know how to you know i won't call it behave but for example uh, uh, it it goes passing the bucks like thing okay teacher got something from their coordinator coordinator got from the vp vp got from the principal and finally it is delivered to the child in terms of reaction shut up you get a side for example i'm sorry i'm i'm using this just to bring into the notice the exact scenario what happens in this school not always but yes it is it is it is there it is there we have to accept this part 
Uh, now the third angle I would like to bring, this was the base, how, how this whole thing system works. Not just the training for reaction and responding directly or a syllabi on this, but I, I believe as a professional, uh, and I care to mention it over here, that imbibing the other uh, virtues, empathy, as have uh, rightly been mentioned with, uh, with the panelists earlier, more than one panelist earlier, yes. A person who is considerate of other person's emotions or understanding of other person's uh, situation, I'm sure that person cannot react in an adverse way to hurt a person or to repent, you know, the reaction for the moment. So it's, it's not as exactly if you're focusing on the word or the training directly on the uh, uh, reaction or the response thing. There are there, there is a couple of, you know, a different gateway to handle it by imbibing more positive emotion. And yes, uh, understanding the psychology, how things are working, how the system is working, how environment is affecting, how, how we can change the environment in every element in the that environment, let's say school environment at the moment, need to work towards this, not just a training, a module, uh, you know, imposed, okay, this is a session for learning this. No, it has to be imbibed from 360 angles, from the management, from the administration, from the, you know, uh, the teachers, from the parental body also, because again, after school, child is going back to home, a lot many things they are picking up at home, how their parents are responding or reacting or behaving. So that all becomes a learned behavior or imbibed knowingly, unknowingly. So definitely, as rightly said, first step need to be there to bring it into awareness or sensitize how, for example, when we talk about fire drills, what sort of uh, steps you're supposed to take to manage in such a situation, right? The, the self-management skills, for example. Second, definitely step could be the self-awareness. Everybody have got their, you know, ups and lows. And treating that would be dif uh, different or more customized to an individual. So self-awareness can pave the way where it is not taken as uh, introspection is not taken as something down thing, but something to build yourself on, right? So we are not talking about reaction and response, but as the personality child is building on this, that, okay, I need to be aware of how do I think, how do I feel? And how do I behave and what are its consequences in general? So whether it is self-awareness, self-management or empathy, being considerate of others, this all thing come together finally to shape up child's personality and conduct, which could be in form of reaction or response. So that's where, uh, 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 and at the same time, I would say, Please be aware that reactions are not always negative. The consequences of it make. So definitely we need to work more on a cognitive plane to make uh, this, uh, uh, to, uh, what to say, make this uh, uh, clear actually to everyone involved that there are consequences of things. Are we ready to face that? How it impact and affect others? Do we really uh, want to say, uh, want to do that or go ahead with that or would we prefer take a back seat for a moment as it is said you know these are the management techniques again spiritual uh, practices whether uh, it's in form of breathing in form of meditation or just a me time in today's time again i'm sure both the principals would agree with me Child is getting up early, uh, put to uh, uh, into the bus or, you know, just dropped to the school. Child is just coming to the uh, classes, doing their work, getting back home or maybe not even home. Straight, they're going to the tuitions. And whole of the day, child is, you know, from you know, one class to the other, this to that. They're just running. Even for the sports, it's, it's, it becomes like so much, not like having a moment of their own to really know themselves who they are, how do they feel, to understand their own emotions. Okay, yeah, this is this is what I'm doing. It's, it's going so mechanically, if you see. The system, if the whole system have become from home to school, school to home or tuitions, it, sorry, it all have become so monotonous that children are not having a breather in between. To realize, to be self-aware, to know, know even their, 
their self potential unless they're into 10 standard and they have to choose a stream it's like you know it doesn't go that way it's, and self awareness is not about about vocation or stream selection or a career choice it's all about knowing yourself as a person as a human being because ultimately to work also when you go as a professional first you are a human being with all your innate qualities somewhere uh, i i i feel this this basic building block the foundation block is missed out in the rush of life or competition or you know becoming this more on a system whether it's education system the career decisions the professional things even for the teachers again i'm coming back because when you talk about the role models are they having this me time to breathe in or to strategize how they would like to go ahead with and i'm sure uh, puna ma'am and dr madhulika ma'am would agree what i'm talking about we all are running away ignoring knowingly as well as unknowingly because we all are in rush of life in in fulfilling the responsibilities professional as well as personal we forgot that we need to respond to the very human within ourselves as well as in front of us so on this note i would uh, like to like uh, stop for a moment and look forward for the deliberation further thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much and this just proves provided with a perfect segue for our next question because ma'am if i may go back to george orwell's 1984 a uh, human emotion was seen as the enemy of a standardized country a standardized state if i may so from taking a point from what ms sharma ma'am has just spoken about puna ma'am if i may come back to you ma'am while we need to perhaps teach students the difference between re reacting and responding we definitely don't want them to become mechanized right to to kind of completely absorb themselves of the emotional burden of the amygdala because as boris sir said earlier that, that is also a very important part of making us who we are ma'am where do we strike the balance yes yes subhayu there are undoubtedly situations that demand us to react and not respond we cannot always trade you know reaction for response if we choose to respond at all time regardless of the nature of the situation we may risk uh, our physical safety and uh, we you know we must teach our students to react and respond when there is some danger and their physical safety is threatened this is one thing then at the same time what uh, um, ms uh, tanuja sharma said that uh, we need to uh, teach them to react to celebrate the achievements of uh, our fellow being of our students so this is also very very important uh, for example and then other you know in the since i am in school and i deal with all kind of students so you know there are situations where we have got to teach them how to um keep themselves safe like from sexual abuse uh, we tell them okay fine you know uh, if somebody approaches you or uh, some you sense some kind of a danger you yeah you yell you shout you scream and that is very very normal in situations like this you cannot expect a child to um, to ponder over the situation to observe and to then plan and then act if someone tries to cause us physical Ham, you know, the child is uh, the person is coming towards us with the uh, with the pistol. What do we do? We have got to react and keep ourselves safe. We must similarly be able to teach uh, students to react and raise voice against cruelties. If we find people inflicting pain on their fellow beings, you know, if uh, or if there is a fight, you've got to. You cannot. Uh, you've got to strike a balance between the two. You can not always be responding. You've got to understand there are situations where it is important that we. react and not wait for the response thank you ma'am thank you so much for highlighting those particular instances uh, dr singh i may if i may come to you with my last question ma'am yes, uh, yes. to your mind how important are sports in our school system school curriculum in developing this sense within a student of reacting responding and choosing which one to use at a particular situation uh, sir as i would uh, really like to agree with tanuja ma'am ki we are in some sort of rush for life basically we our syllabus or our curriculum are designed such 
that we basically just focus on uh, teaching the students getting their knowledge subject knowledge basically uh, to that date ki that they succeed in life in terms of marks only we hardly think or we hardly design our curriculums uh, that students should know how to react when to react or how to respond or when to uh, respond like just now puna ma'am have sh uh, shared ki there are situations when they have to really think ki what they should be doing there are situations they have to react immediately or uh, there are situations when they have to respond so i feel like some uh, ki the curriculum really needs to be Uh, uh, like uh, our present nep is also saying that it should be less burdened up with only the subject knowledge there should be some uh, life skills included in such a manner that students get to uh, not only uh, develop cognitive levels but also emotional levels so that uh, their eq that is emotional quotient should be developed they should be self aware they should have some empathy they sh they should critically basically analyze the situations for which they have to um, like respond or react whatever it is so uh, for that it is necessary that certain uh, uh, methods techniques or uh, uh, i think uh, methodology methodology should be adopted or adapted in any way so that we can uh, really uh, not only uh, develop or uh, inculcate certain good so called good habits good habits like uh, just for example uh, we are on a road there are traffic jams when we normally see in our cities that people uh, just line up without even know, uh, understanding that the uh, co uh, vehicle coming from uh, like coming uh, from the opposite side might end up uh, not cross crossing so there are certain Uh, like realizing the situation ki we might put someone else into problem or uh, giving them certain uh, uh, sort of senses sensitizing the situations or giving their emotions to such a level that they should understand the others also they should not only uh, be giving themselves importance or their situations to be important empathizing with others others motivating them to be a good citizen these should needed to be included in the syllabus so i think a lot have to be re required to be done uh, with the curriculum basically not only uh, over piling them with only uh, academics uh, needs to be taken care of thank you ma'am thank you so so much uh we've gone quite over our time limit so unfortunately we'll have to draw this session to a close but this has been extremely enriching and uh, i must thank each and every one of you for giving us such a wealth of advice and experience uh from your years of dealing with schools and children uh first of all barit sir thank you so much for this wonderful start that you gave us i believe sir we have over these so many episodes of the together for education webinar we've always learned from your tremendous experiences tremendous insight into our schooling system and today was no different so thank you so much for highlighting the physiological differences and how our emotional state uh, can be controlled through years of practice thank you thank you for that sir uh osin thank you for your wonderful presentation i think you highlighted some great anecdotes and some examples of how mindfulness can make all the difference uh to all our three panelists uh dr singh Ms. Sharma and Mrs. Navid, thank you so so much for sparing your experience and expertise with us. Uh, I have been host of most of these together for education webinars, so this is almost the hundred and seventy ninth episode. Uh, today we had a very difficult question in front of you that we wanted to start talking to you about how response is preferred over reaction, and then ask you how reaction is seen at times. Essentially, ask you to paint a box both black and white at the same time, and it has amazed us. over these last 2 years that how teachers on a day to day basis do this effortlessly they walk this fine rope of maintaining a student's individuality while teaching them the right skills for life and if we are today a country of 1.3 billion people and still working harmoniously together still moving ahead still growing most of that credit is due to all you teachers so thank you thank you so much for all of that 
to our audience here thank you so much for being with us for one more episode uh, we look forward to having you again for the next episode until then please take care stay safe and goodbye thank you thank you thank you thank you thank, thank, you. thank you so much notebook for having us thank you so much thank for you. the opportunity to share thank you and pleasure meeting you puna ma'am and dr madhurika ma'am same here ma'am <laughs> same here same here same here thank you. thank you so much thank you it was good pleasure. listening to you uh Thank you. Dr. Madhulika and uh, Ms. Tanuja, and I've uh, attended the seminars before, so I'm a big fan of uh, Mr. Philip and uh, Ar- Achin Bhattacharya. So it was a pleasure listening to both of them. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Subhayu. Thank you. thank you so much, ma'am. This is all ours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Subhayu. And thank you, Mr. Philip, for being the ground of the discussion. It was very so, well spoken. It's lovely to hear you. My 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 connection went off midway. So I lost about five minutes, but I'm glad I, I got back to say bye. Thank you. It it was really. Uh, this is my first time with Philip and Ajin, but really I. This was the most difficult question I think, and it really gave us some uh, food to think for our minds, especially. <laughs> we we have we should really think on all these things, and I think this is the answer to the present situations. Uh, like I could I should say the ag- aggression. uh which is uh, driving the world crazy basically <laughs> and things uh, uh, going to a certain level i think st- teaching students and even parents or people around us to really think about the difference know the difference between these two is a uh, and taking uh, such a topic is also uh, giving us some uh, really good food for our minds also so i think this is this was a great opportunity even for me to hear to such good and elite panelist uh, thank you tanuja ma'am poonam ma'am philip sir and achin sir for such a opportunity and thank, thank you, you thank you